Hey guys, Dr. Gooden here to talk about chronic adaptations to aerobic training programs. I'm Dr. Jacob Gooden, Professor of Kinesiology at Point Loma Nazarene University. And in this video, we are going to talk about how the body responds and adapts to consistently implemented aerobic training. In the last video, we talked about how the body responds acutely, but now we'll get into some of those long-term and chronic changes. Let's dive right in. This information comes from Chapter 6 of Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning, and the chapter was written by Drs. Ann Swank and Carwin Sharp. Now the primary cardiovascular adaptations to aerobic training programs are increases in maximal cardiac output, so the amount of blood that the heart can pump each minute, increases in stroke volume. This is the amount of ventricular filling during diastole, and subsequently it's an increase in blood that is pumped with every heartbeat, as well as increased fiber capillary density. <clears throat> So remember that our capillaries are like networks of very small, very fine blood vessels that deliver the blood the last mile, so to speak, to your individual muscle fibers. And the more capillaries that you have, the greater the amount of blood and therefore the amount of oxygen that can be delivered to each of your muscle fibers. And we also have an increased parasympathetic tone. And what this does is it leads to an increase in the resting and submaximal exercise heart rates. And this is one reason why elite endurance athletes tend to have very, very low resting heart rates. Heart rates of well below 60 into the 50s, into the low 40s, even into the mid to low 30s. And being a recovering distance athlete myself, I used to pride myself in college on having a very low resting heart rate of around 40 to 42. Since then, uh, it's climbed back up into like the 50s, mid 50s. But my wife, who's also a distance athlete, and she's currently a distance athlete and still competes, she actually looked it up the other day and the lowest recorded resting heart rate is 26 beats per minute. So phenomenally low. I'm not really sure if that's still an advantage at that point, but one of the changes to aerobic training is an increased parasympathetic tone. Now for respiratory adaptations, these can be highly specific depending on what activities you are using to train aerobically. So let's say that you have an athlete who's a runner, maybe he or she is a long distance athlete and they get improvements in their minute ventilation because of their training. Well, if you throw that athlete in the pool, that improvement in minute ventilation may not carry over because of the difference in breathing patterns during that type of exercise. So ventilatory adaptations can be specific to the mode of aerobic training that your athletes are undertaking. Now we also have neural adaptations and these are also highly specific to the mode of training. The benefit of neural adaptations is that efficiency is increased and fatigue is delayed. Now if you were coaching that same runner in the previous example, the neural adaptations would contribute to improved running economy. Running economy is a measure of the ATP cost of exercise or of running, just like swimming economy would be a measure of the ATP cost of swimming at a specific speed or cycling economy. So really exercise economy is sort of the general term. And if it's a runner or a swimmer or a cyclist, then you would name it by that mode of aerobic training. So runners want to improve running economy. If they improve their cycling economy, that doesn't necessarily help them for their running because it's a very different motor pattern and different motor units, even different muscle groups that they're using from one mode of aerobic training to the next. Some other neural adaptations include rotation of neural activity among synergists. At the level of the motor unit, this is known as motor unit cycling. So one motor unit can kick in in order to help the muscle to contract, and then it can shut off and be allowed to recharge and be allowed to dissipate some fatigue while another motor unit kicks in to take its place. And by cycling motor units, you allow some to rest while the others are doing the work. And then those that are doing the work get to rest and the rested motor units now get to kick in again. But it also happens at the level of the muscle. So if you have more strategic timing and firing of the synergist muscles, we can maintain those lower levels of force output for longer. This is contrary to adaptations to anaerobic training, which tends to encourage synchronous firing of motor units, which means that we have all of those motor units contracting at the same time to produce maximal force. 
But in the case of aerobic exercise, we typically want to extend the duration of exercise, not increase the intensity. And so we have motor unit cycling instead. There are also muscular adaptations to aerobic exercise. And one of the fundamental adaptive responses to aerobic training is an increase in the aerobic capacity of the trained musculature. Now what this does is it allows the athlete to train at a submaximal intensity for longer. It essentially increases the endurance or the muscular endurance of the trained musculature, but not the untrained musculature. So remember that things like cardiovascular and ventilatory responses are central. They affect the whole body, but muscular adaptations are very localized because the trained muscles will experience the adaptations, but if you don't train a certain muscle group aerobically, then it won't experience the adaptation. So for example, let's say that you have a cyclist and they're always training their lower body on the bike. If you never do anything for their arms, yes, their arms will still be fairly small as in terms of muscle mass. They'll probably still have a high percentage of type one muscle fibers because probably this athlete was geared that way anyways, and they may not do a lot of lifting or other activity with their upper body, but their upper body will not experience the same amount of aerobic adaptation as their lower body will due to cycling. We also have fiber type transitioning. Now we've spoken previously about fiber type transitions in anaerobic training, and really it's the case that with any form of training, we tend to get conversions from type 2X down to type 2A muscle fibers, or from those very fast, very fatigable, large muscle fibers to somewhat of an intermediate muscle fiber. Now the same thing, but to a greater extent, will happen with aerobic training, because not only is the aerobic training at a lower intensity threshold, so lower power outputs, lower force production, but you can sustain it for longer. And now the volume of exercise is increased, and the amount of stimulus for that change from type 2X to type 2A to type 1 is increased. Now there's not much evidence to show that type 2X fibers will convert all the way down to type 1s, but we do see that these fast twitch fibers start to take on some semblance of type 1 fibers, meaning greater mitochondrial density, fewer glycolytic enzymes, greater oxidative enzymes, and overall smaller cross-sectional area. Now as far as bone and connective tissue adaptations go, we saw with anaerobic training in previous videos that bone and cartilage and connective tissue could be remodeled significantly. With aerobic training, it really sort of peaks out at a certain threshold because we're not providing enough stimulus for growth. We're probably not surpassing the strain threshold of this tissue when we train aerobically, at least not after the initial adaptations to exercise. So if you get up off the couch and you start running today, having never run before, yes, there will be some adaptations, but eventually those will plateau and you'll get no further adaptations unless you increase the forces that these tissues encounter with something like weight training. Now we have endocrine adaptations as well. Aerobic exercise leads to increases in hormonal circulation and changes at the receptor level. So we see increases in testosterone, insulin, insulin-like growth, growth factors like IGF-1, and growth hormone, as well as changes in the receptors of these hormones. We do see, however, that trained athletes have a blunted response to submaximal exercise, meaning that if you are a well-trained runner or cyclist or swimmer, and you go out for your run, bike, or swim, you won't get the same magnitude of change in your endocrine system. You won't get as dramatic of an increase in these circulating hormones. And in fact, we see that in some cases due to overexercise or maybe poor energy availability, we do see that some of these anabolic hormones, especially testosterone, can actually decrease as a result of chronically overtraining using aerobic exercise. So to sum that up, as well as to introduce a couple more points, Aerobic endurance training results in reduced body fat, which we hadn't talked about previously, but yes, it does burn fat. And because we can train for such a long period of time, it is a great way to reduce body fat if you have enough time to train. It also can increase maximal oxygen uptake. We get increased running or exercise economy, increased respiratory capacity, lower blood lactate concentrations at submaximal exercise, so recall our conversations previously in other videos about pushing that lactate curve 
out to the right. We'll talk about that more in a second. Increased mitochondrial and capillary densities and improved aerobic enzyme activity. Now, one of the main adaptations that most people focus on for aerobic endurance training is the increase in maximal oxygen uptake or an improvement in the VO2 max. And intensity of training is one of the most important factors to improving this. So you really need to be running at close to 90% of your VO2 max or even up to just over it for a considerable period of time in order to raise it. However, physiologically, some individuals may not be able to increase their VO2 max very much at all. There's a window of trainability that is highly variable. Some people are kind of stuck at their VO2 max and other people have some amount of adaptation that can occur. And in well-trained individuals, most of them have really plateaued. They've reached their maximal oxygen uptake and no further amount of aerobic training will improve that. So how do they improve performance? Well, there are other factors that play into aerobic endurance performance. The first of which is the lactate threshold. So here we see um, some typical lactate performance curves from different types of track athletes. So a sprinter, middle distance athlete, and marathoner. Now a sprinter will start building up blood lactate very quickly at very low speeds, you know, before 3.5 meters per second. So that's like a slow jog. This is one reason why we don't really need our sprinters to be out there jogging because it's very fatiguing for them. Their race occurs at 10 meters per second or around there if, if they're males. And that's, if we look at the graph, that's way out over here, right? Probably off the page, 10, it's supposed to be a 10, 10 meters per second. And so improving their lactate threshold isn't going to help them run any faster, especially because of the duration of their event, it's so short. Similarly, a middle distance athlete will be running somewhere out here, maybe between six and eight meters per second. And so yes, improving the lactate threshold will help them a little bit. They'll accumulate less lactate during their event, but for events like the 800 or 1500, the entire event occurs above the lactate threshold. So it's really folks like marathoners and half marathoners and down to the 10K who benefit greatly from an improvement in lactate threshold. So these true aerobic endurance athletes, if we can improve their lactate threshold, meaning they can run at a faster pace or greater percentage of their VO2 max without accumulating lactate. Now they can race at a higher pace. Here's an example of this. We switched from meters per second to kilometers per hour, but the shape of the graph is really what's important. So this blue curve is pre-training and this red curve is post-training. And notice that at the same level of lactate accumulation, the athlete can now run about a half a kilometer per hour faster. And that is significant. That translates to, I don't know, maybe 10 seconds per mile faster. And in something like a 10K where you're running 6.2 miles or maybe even in a marathon where you're running 26.2, that amounts to a substantial difference. So an improvement in the lactate threshold is one way that elite athletes can, can continue to improve their performance. Another way is through running economy. And this comes from a paper by Midgley et al. And it's investigating determinants of racing performance. And we can see that, yes, VO2 max is important. And it's one of the foundational things that sets up your mean race pace. But we also have lactate threshold, which dictates your sustainable percent of VO2 max. And that's essentially your VO2 max at race pace, or the percent of your VO2 max that you can sustain throughout the race. This sets up what we call the performance VO2 or the oxygen that you use on average at the pace that you're running during your race. And this represents the highest sustainable rate of ATP resynthesis. Now, if you improve your running economy, meaning that you can take this rate of ATP resynthesis and you can suddenly do more with the same amount, meaning let's say just totally made up numbers, let's say you have 100 units of ATP that you can use. And previously that allowed you to run 12 miles an hour. Well, what if you improve your running economy or running efficiency, and now you can run 12 and a half miles an hour with the same 100 units of ATP. And that's what running economy is. So lactate threshold and running economy are both highly trainable factors. And through aerobic endurance training, we can improve those in our athletes, whether they're runners or cyclists or swimmers, 
or triathletes. We just have to be specific to the mode of aerobic endurance training. And we have to remember that sometimes things that don't look a lot like their activity will help improve those. For instance, weight training will help improve running economy by enabling the musculature to have greater rates of force development, by increasing the total power capacity of the musculature so that, so that now every individual step is a lower percent of the overall power output of that athlete. Both my audio and video cut out there at the end, but essentially the key takeaway is that the adaptations to aerobic training are very different than those to anaerobic training. In anaerobic training, we encounter very high forces that can remodel bone and tendon in an advantageous way. They also utilize different energy systems. In aerobic training, there's lower forces. We get fiber type conversion uh, more readily from our faster fiber types down to slower isoforms. We also get neural adaptations that tend to be different. So with anaerobic training, we get the ability to synchronously recruit many motor units at once versus aerobic training where our motor units are taught to then cycle in order to avoid fatigue. And so different sports will require different amounts of aerobic versus anaerobic training. And especially those athletes who need a bit of both, like say a soccer player or a hockey player, actually most of our team sport athletes, they will need some aerobic adaptations and some anaerobic adaptations. So we have to be careful on when we are dosing them, how we are timing them. And if you're interested in learning more about how to program, then stay tuned because in future videos, we are going to talk about how to create annual training programs for these various types of athletes. So if you had any questions about this video, let me know down in the comments below. And as always, I'll see you guys on the next video. Sure.